John Osborne, 1561, says, can you tell us a Grant Imahara story? I love hearing about him. I'll tell you two Grant Imahara stories. Um, I will tell you that in a place like ILM, Grant's nerdiness, intelligence, and kindness stood out. And I don't mean each of those qualities. I mean the, the combination and excess of all three of those that Grant had really stood out. Like, he was unique at the model shop. That's for sure. Um, <clears throat> and um, there was this... Uh, uh, so movie stars came through the model shop all the time because it was the sexy part of the ILM tour. Because what are you going to do? You're going to take a movie star to a bunch of offices with people sitting at desks and working on workstations? That's not sexy. Uh, so the model shop was always the end of every tour. And we got to see Clint Eastwood come through. And Sean and Robin Wright Penn came through with their kids. And Anthony Daniels and Ray Park. I mean, all these people came through. Um, and uh, in sync, yeah, in sync came through. That's Justin Timberlake's old band, right? I'm probably right. <laughs> NSYNC comes through, and they don't have Justin Timberlake with them, but they have been recording an album up at Skywalker Sound. Mm. So apparently, they also did like brief... No, I didn't talk to you. They also did a brief cameo in episode one or two. I can't remember which one. I think it was episode two. Um... And they came down to the model shop for a tour. And Grant Imahara's desk uh, at the model, when they were touring the model shop, it was on the uh, south side of Kerner Boulevard. The model shop used to be on the north side of Kerner Boulevard. This time it was on the south side. And they come through to, and Grant's, uh, Grant's desk was right on the other side of the break room. And so InSync gets this tour through the model shop and they come through the break room and they're about to leave. There's only like half a dozen desks between the break room and the exit. And they walk out and they look and they see Grant's desk had in front of it low, dead low, um, his robot that he fought at BattleBots with. Uh, and I, I, one of InSync, could it have been Joey Fatone? One of InSync looked and said, dead low? <laughs> And then panned up, and there was Grant, like, soldering, and he went, Grant Imahara! <laughs> and that's when Grant discovered that NSYNC were fans of his as a robot builder. I heard this in the break room. Just amazing. Absolutely amazing. And, like, completely deserved. It was hilarious to have, like, one of the most famous... Like, this is a group of some of the most famous people in the world at that moment in time, and they come through and they're like, Grant Imahara! Fabulous. Um, the other, the other thing I wanted to tell you about Grant uh, is he was a phenomenal impressionist. Grant did incredible impressions of people, um, his coworkers. He did an impression of me. I never got to see it. <laughs> I have been told that his impression of me involves a lot of drumming on the table. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing about his impressions were is that you'd be like you know you'd be hanging out on Monday in the break room and you'd be talking about how Friday after beers like everyone had a few too many and we had a really fun time and like hung out until like 10 p.m. in the model shop that would happen and then weird shit would happen somebody would do something fun or weird we would be talking about it but with Grant if he was telling you one of those stories, he'd be he'd be doing impressions of each of the people. And there's a thing about people that can do that sort of casually that I find really fascinating because there it takes deep watching. Um, but also, Grant's impressions were absolutely never at the expense of the person he was impersonating. They were never an impression that I think the person would have minded. And that, like, that's real. That's built right in. That was built right into Grant at the, at the root level, uh, that kind of kindness. 
And I wish I'd gotten to see his impression of me. David Strom, David Strom, 4524. David Strom says, I recently watched the Tesla earthquake machine episode. Can you talk more about how Grant Imahara's device affected the large bridge? Jamie looked genuinely unsettled. How large a device would be needed to be a real concern? Um, this is a great question, and I'm going to give a little bit of overview because uh, this is one of my favorite episodes, and in my history with the show, so this is going to be a Mythbusters story. In my history with the show, the things that I remember are like the moments in which I understood more about what my job was, or I saw places that I could contribute. And so the myth is that we were starting is that a group of soldiers marching in lockstep on a bridge can cause that bridge to uh, start to oscillate at a what's called a fatal harmonic that can uh, destroy the structural integrity of the bridge. And we called the episode Break Step Bridge. And it's a long and storied urban legend. Uh, famously, actually, when the, uh, the Brits opened up the Millennium Bridge in London, um, they had issues with that bridge moving. And it was a fascinating thing because when people were on the bridge and it moved and they felt it moving, their mode of correcting for it was actually causing a feedback loop that made it move more. So it was like we got to watch Break Step Bridge uh, happen. So story-wise, if you want to tell a story about something causing a fatal harmonic to a bridge-like structure, you have to come up with a point of view. You have to choose a bridge. What bridge are you going to choose? It's going to be an arch bridge. This is going to be a stone bridge. It's going to be a suspension bridge. What, what kind of bridge? We chose suspension as we figured it's, it's spectacular. It is a, uh, it's a tensegrity model, so it's under its own tension and its strength is created by its own tension. So we might be able to see it move like the Tacoma Narrows. So we chose the suspension bridge. But then if you want to narratively talk about what can cause a destructive amount of force on a bridge, you need to build a bridge in which a, drug, a destructive amount of force can be applied to it. I know that sounds totally obvious, but if I build a suspension bridge, in scale, and then I apply a force to it and it doesn't break, what have I proven to you? I have only proven that I've built a bridge that can sustain that. If I want to investigate a certain kind of effect on it, I have to build it in a way that it can be destroyed. And this was the first and biggest issue we had with Break Step Bridge as a story, which is bridges are way over-designed for all the best reasons in the world, and it is really hard to design one that can be messed up by a fatal harmonic. Um, and so, I mean, this, I remember having one of my first big arguments with my producer about this because uh, we didn't understand where each was coming from, but I was really understanding. No, no, no. If we're going to show that it can survive, we have to sh we have to know at what point it fails. We have to if we're going to graph it to success from destruction, we have to have destruction as a point on the graph. Um, but why was I telling the story? Right. So we were talking about ways to create a fatal harmonic, and a, a harmonic is simply that we're talking about is simply being pushed on a swing. This is what to think about when I'm describing a harmonic. When you are being pushed on a swing, here you are, you are swinging and you're coming and I give you a push and you swing a little farther and you come and I add a little more impetus. And each time what I'm doing is I'm taking the amount of energy and I'm adding a little bit to the system. And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about soldiers marching in step. They're adding, adding an impetus to the system. And if you add that impetus at the apex of, at the end of each pendulum movement of that system, you can build up a lot of force with a little. Consider how high you can push your friends while you've been drinking in the park late at night, uh, and you can get like almost horizontal. Uh, and that is, that is what we're talking about. And there are ways, so how do you, how do you apply a force? Uh, this was a gigantic fight that Jamie and I have. Uh, Joe, Joe Cooper just gifted a membership. Richard A. just gifted a membership. Thank you. We had this huge fight because Jamie 
had found a bunch of pneumatic cylinders that were like a quarter of a pie. And they, uh, they actually made a lever. They actually had, they, they moved a lever 90 degrees. And Jamie had found a bunch of these surplus and he really liked the idea of putting boots on these and having these be our quote unquote soldiers. And I had a huge issue with this because if we were going to impose a rhythmic harmonic on this bridge, our timing was absolutely millisecond critical. That's what I viewed from an engineering standpoint. I thought our timing is millisecond critical. We want to be able to adjust the impetus of the addition of force to an incredibly fine degree. And pneumatics are not the way to do that. No, sir. Pneumatics are spongy and they have variable start times and you can lose a little bit of pressure and timing can change very quickly. It's very hard to maintain a constant pressure with pneumatic systems, especially if you've got like a whole bunch of these boot soldiers. We had this huge fight. I made my case. Okay, Dad. Could you try? We had this huge fight, Jamie and I did. I made my case and then I gave it up. Uh, he said this was really important to him. And so we went with the pneumatics and they didn't quite work. And that's when we had found out about this um, magnetic actuator, which used a, 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 a rod filled with stacked reversed magnets and a, a coil that allowed it to move the shaft of this uh, to any degree at any kind of speed. It was like a brand new pneumatic, a brand new actuator. So again, this was just a cylinder with stack magnets inside and a housing that that cylinder went in and the housing had coil in it. And you could activate this coil or coils in here and make the cylinder move anywhere you wanted and at any speed. Really cool device. Except that it was so new, you couldn't buy it with a program that could run it. And so we called up Grant and we're like, Grant, could you come over and help us program this thing and maybe program it for us? And he said, absolutely. Um, and so uh, actually, I think it's Grant that knew about this device. Now that I'm thinking about it, I believe he knew that this device existed. We ordered it, discovered it needed programming and brought him over to do it. And that's when we were able to really see and graph that we were adding an impetus at the right time. Um, and yeah, when you do, you build up a lot of energy. It can be quite spooky. That was, that was a really difficult story to tell. Um, making a bridge that could be broken was... Jamie and I, neither of us understood or neither of us understood how complex the parameters of that story was when we, when we first dove into it. Um, and it was a real education that whole way through. Um, final denouement on this story, which is years later, Jamie and I have had some other fight about some story and we're driving the next day and we're talking about this argument that we'd had. And Jamie was like, Jamie, um, Jamie was, uh, uh, Jamie is I, uh, slightly on the spectrum and he likes to come up with plans to not have conflict again. When conflict has happened, he likes to talk about it and likes to talk about ways that conflict might not happen. And so we're sitting there talking about this argument and Jamie says, well, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking that if we disagree about the aesthetics of something, that the science should win. Like the science should rule out uh, when we have a disagreement. And I said, Jamie, I totally agree with that one. And he says, I'm trying to think of a, of a case, you know, I mean, it was like break step bridge. And I'm like, do you mean when you wanted the aesthetic, you, after trashing me for years for being the goofy one who likes to add flames to stuff and that would make you sick to your stomach, quote unquote, you're the one that fought for these cute booted pneumatic actuators that didn't actually execute our experiment correctly. And then you realized you were wrong in this conversation years later. And he was like, oh yeah, I guess so. I didn't even get the satisfaction of an apology. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support us even further, you can by becoming a tested member. Uh, details are, of course, below, but it includes all sorts of perks and we're building them all the time. You get advanced word and behind the scenes photos of some of our projects. 
questions. You get to ask direct questions during my live streams, and we have some members-only videos, including the Adam real-time series of unbroken, unedited shots of me working here in the shop. They are weirdly meditative. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you on the next one.